in Jesus' name, amen. I've been reading through a book uh, called The Holy Spirit by Bill Lehman, so this sermon is based on a chapter from that book. Let's start off uh, by reading Zechariah 4, verses 1 through 9. Zechariah 4, verses 1 through 9. Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me, as a man who has wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? So I said, I am looking, and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it, and on the stand seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he, he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His, lands, his hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. In this vision shown to Zechariah is a guarantee of success in carrying forth, work of, forth the work of God on this earth to completion. It will be accomplished by none of the things or methods that we think it will be finished by. Rather, the work will be completed by my spirit. That will be a happy day. We used to be Seventh-day Adventists who thought about completion, but now because of problems, difficulties, neglect, and callousness, we cannot see how the work will ever be completed by us using our feeble efforts. Therefore, a few decades ago, many who were once on fire to see the work finished began to think more in terms of retirement. To many who are reaching a certain age, retirement has taken the place of heaven. Then when retirement does not have the joys that they anticipate, they start talking about heaven again. There was a time when pastors and and evangelists never gave any thought to retirement plans and policies. Prophesying of the last days, Isaiah said that darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people in Isaiah 6 verse 2. In the context of the last days, he appeals in the same verse to God's people to arise, shine, for thy light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. The source of all the light to dispel the darkness of the last days is provided in the oil, the oil which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The light is That light is found no other place. In ancient days after the Babylonian captivity was over, under seemingly impossible circumstances and the constant harassment by an enemy, God said to a small number of people doing a monumental job, that they would finish the work of rebuilding the temple. It was a guarantee they would finish it, if they trusted in his spirit. It was the work of Zerubbabel, who was the prime builder of the temple destroyed by the Babylonians, to lay the foundation stone of the temple. And he would finish that too. When that was accomplished, there was great joy. This incident has been spoken of by many preachers in many places for many years. It still has, been, still has not been carried out in reference to the last days. It has been talked about, but seldom demonstrated. Today we think of many other methods of finishing the Lord's work. I am not finding fault. I simply said that we are working with many methods. God is blessing in some of those methods. Some people believe that through a new method yet to be discovered, we will find the magic formula that finishes the work and the Lord has said repeatedly that there is no magic formula. 
It is a special person who will take the charge and finish the work. He makes all the difference in the world. Many of the things we are doing today are substitutes for the Holy Spirit. For some reason or other, we cannot see that so many of our ideas in finishing the work could be holding back the Spirit from doing His work. Some are blind to the fact that they are taking, taking to themselves glory that belongs only to God. We cannot understand that we can be blessed and used by the Spirit as were Zechariah and Zerubbabel. It is as though we think and act like having the Holy Spirit and His power in finishing the work is mo more impossible than the methods we use. Our actions say that we have more trust in our methods of evangelism and less trust in the abilities of the power of the Holy Spirit. The work of Seventh-day Adventists is revealed in reference to God's house in heaven above. We understand this cleansing process of the sanctuary in our mind and spirit, but we know this is not a physical rebuilding. We are restoring the ministry of Christ in the temple of God and in people's hearts so that the Spirit of God can live there as he dwells in us. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, to accomplish a rebuilding and restoration of the ministry that Christ began in heaven. We find some comments about this which are so applicable to our times. In Prophets and Kings, page 594, throughout the history of God's people, great mountains of difficulty, apparently insurmountable, have loomed up before those who are trying to carry out the purposes of heaven. Such obstacles are permitted by the Lord as a test of faith. When we are hedged about on every side, this is the time above all others to trust in God and in the power of the Spirit. If the difficulty is small, we might say that if we get the right person, we might be able to overcome that one. When the difficulties start to get really large, we are sufficiently awed by it. We say that no one can do that. That is a good time. We need higher mountains in our way because we are still trusting in human effort. Apparently the impossibilities are not yet big enough in our minds or we would not trust in ourselves. Someday we will be hedged about on every side and we will turn away from the ideas of feeble human beings to trust our mighty God. Um, continuing in that quote in Prophets and Patriarchs and Prophets, the exercise of living faith means an increase of spiritual strength and the development of an unfaltering trust. It is thus that the spirit, it is thus that the soul becomes a conquering power. Before the demand of faith, the obstacles placed by Satan across the pathway of the Christian will disappear. For the powers of heaven will come to his aid. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. In Matthew, it says in Matthew 17, 20. As we come to the last days, those who will not fall entirely asleep will sense the tremendous obstacle that stand in the way of completion of God's work. I think it, I think it is wonderful that we have so many financial difficulties. I hope that it gets worse. We are so trusting in ourselves. We gather together all the best brains that we have with all their education and over lengthy discussions we try to find new solutions. The truth is that we have not found any good solutions in many years about these problems, but still are meeting together. We do not have good answers, and this is good. The Lord is long-suffering and waiting for us to discover that we do not have any answers. Then suddenly, in our desperation, we will cry out, as did Peter when he began sinking in the waves, Lord, help us lest we die. That is good. It is difficult to convince proud human beings that they are incapable. The Lord is trying to teach us in our helplessness that he is always available. It is good that the problems of the last days are gigantic. The real warriors for Christ in bygone years have always faced adversities that seemed impossible. Missionaries to Africa, India, and similar places like that around the earth Persons here and there convinced that 
through Christ all things are possible. These are some things that we do not think of much these days. If we see a big difficulty somewhere, we say, don't send me there. Today we are looking for green pastures, not problems. Pastures who are not called of the Lord like churches with no troubles, where everything is wonderful. So they can lie down in green pastures and sleep and sleep. That does not produce faith. We do not like the places that challenge us and force us to our knees until we get calluses on them. Many do not like the difficult places in missionary work and are hoping that they will not be sent to an undesirable neighborhood. Don't make me do that. Give me easy tasks. The problem is that easy tasks, tasks make spiritual weaklings. The difficult tasks make spiritual muscles. And some t someday we... Someday we have to become bold as we stand before mighty problems until after a while, like Paul, we can say, send me to Rome, which was the worst, worst possible place he could go. He could hardly wait until he got there, and we think he must have been insane. No, he had tremendous faith that God wanted to do a mighty work in the seat of evil. This is the story found in Zechariah 4, that we read at the beginning of this message. Who are thou, O great mountain? Men and women of great faith will make a plain where mountains of difficulty once were. The spirit of prophecy develops some of the ideas about these mountains of difficulty and problems. The way of the world is, is to begin with pomp and boasting. God's way is to make the day of small things the beginning of gl the glorious triumph of truth and righteousness. Sometimes he trains his workers by bringing them disappointment and apparent failure. It is his purpose that they shall learn to master difficulties. The way we handle failure determines the way we handle success. God has a difficult time trusting people with success if he cannot trust them with failure. To give up because of failure means that when successful, it will swell your head until your hat size is so big that you cannot get through any door. The Lord cannot trust many with success. We pray and pray for achieving success, but he cannot trust us because self-inflation is such a danger. We long for big things, but he says that when we become able to handle failure, we can handle success. To reiterate this, here again is part of the above quote about failures. God brings them disappointment and apparent failure. It is his purpose that they shall learn to master difficulties. The quote continues in Prophets and Kings. Other men are tempted to falter before the perplexities and obstacles that confront them. But if they were to hold the beginning of their confidence steadfast unto the end, God will make the way clear. Success will come to them as they struggle against difficulties. Human power and human might do not establish the church of God, and neither can they destroy it, not on the rock of human strength, but on Jesus Christ, the rock of ages, was the church founded. And the gates of hell shall not, shall not prevail against it. The presence of God gives stability to his cause. Put not your trust in princes nor in the Son of Man is the word that comes to us. In quietness and in confidence sh shall be your strength. God's glorious work, founded on the eternal principles of right, will never come to naught. It will go on from strength to strength, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, shall the Lord, uh, said the Lord of hosts. Those simple words have gotten inside of some people and caused them to fully believe it and never doubt. They have gone out to do great things for God. Many of us try to get sufficient education and experience that we think will prepare us to do this kind of work. And we leave out the one thing that counts. By my spirit, saith the Lord. He is available to everyone. It does not matter how well-educated well or uneducated a person is. 
the Spirit is available to all. He was the one who brought success to Zerubbabel, the man after the Babylonian captivity who set the foundation of the temple and also finished the work. He will give the same success to every other human who really trusts him and God's words. There is no other way. We have difficulty accepting this. Some try many things and think that they are successful because of those new or strange methods or ideas. Yet it is not successful in God's eyes. The only true success comes by his spirit. The, word, the world's success will soon pass away, but the Lord's success goes on and on and never comes to an end. The one essential element is the Spirit. You should know of the parable of the ten virgins found in Matthew 25. For a while they all had oil, but the groom seemed to delay, so they all slumbered and slept. Some were unprepared and some were prepared. The preparation was having enough oil to pour into their lamps. The oil, of course, represents the Holy Spirit. When the bridegroom finally came, everyone awakened, and some still had oil to place in their lamps, which they trimmed, and the lamps went on to light the way to the marriage. Some had to go find oil first. They came back, and the door to the wedding had already been shut. They tried to get in, asking that the door be opened unto them. But the Lord <coughs> answered, answered that he knew them not. The one element that is singled out by Jesus was the oil. He did not mention another thing. Just one thing was missing with the foolish virgins, and that was the oil. We like to make other things important, but somehow Jesus laid em emphasis on this one simple point. That is that it was his spirit that made the difference. It made all the difference, whether they were in or out, whether prepared or unprepared, whether they had light or darkness, and all that it implies symbolically. Therefore, when you study about the Holy Spirit, some people might think that it is just an interesting topic, theolo theology or curiosity. Not at all. The Holy Spirit is infinitely different than curiosity in theology. This is the one essential power that ha every human being needs, or they will be not be inside the new Jerusalem. They will be locked out. We have not made the oil a test. We have made the Sabbath, right doctrines, Christian living, and many other things be tests, but not the oil. In fact, we do not, do not know how to tell if people do or do not have the oil. Can you give a Bible study on how to discern whether people have the oil or do not have it? You would have to scratch your head for a while about that. We assume that we have the oil because we are church members, and everything must be all right. The spirit of prophecy makes it clear that all the ten virgins were Seventh-day Adventist church members, or they would not have had any light to begin with. He told his disciples the story of the ten virgins by their experience, illustrating the experience of the church that shall live just before the second coming. All have a knowledge of the scriptures. The class represented by the foolish, foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They have a regard for the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth, but they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon the rock, Jesus Christ, and permitted their old nature to be broken up. They do not know God. They have not studied his character. They have not held communion with him. Therefore, they do not know how to trust, how to look and live. They are lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of his word is to no avail. One may be familiar, familiar with the commandments and promises of the Bible, but unless the Spirit of God sets the truth home, the character will not be transformed. Without the enlightenment of the Spirit, they will not be able to distinguish truth from error, and they will fall under the masterful temptations of Satan. Some prepared and some did not. Some were blessed of the Spirit 
and some did not care about this. Never put your trust only in doctrine, but this is what we emphasize the most. Seek the Spirit to dwell in your heart as if your mortal life depends on it, and your eternal life certainly does. If there ever were a time when delusion and deception have come to the Adventist church, it is today. I think the delusions of today are as bad or worse than pantheism, which in bygone years was the worst deception that came up with it within the church through Kellogg. There are people in the church who do not even know that there are deceptions. They listen to those who speak deception and cannot tell that they are hearing deception. They are still waiting for the day of deception to come. It has been here for a long time. Most people think that they can avoid deception with good theology. If they are really sharp students of the Bible, they think that they will make it. Usually in all of the discussions of deception that comes along on unusual doctrines, almost every Adventist will use logic and theology to dis disprove the other person. The, the, the spirit of prophecy does not say that this is what will save us from deception or bless us. Recall from the previous quote that Ellen White wrote, Without the enlightenment of the spirit, they will not be able to distinguish truth from error and they will fall under the masterful temptations of Satan. This means that all the good theology I have will not keep me from deception. Unless the Holy Spirit enlightens you, you cannot make it with theology. I never hear discussions about these deceptions except I hear theology from every side. There is only one weakness in theology, and that is what we have between our ears. There are a lot of problems between our ears. If you depend on that to keep you from deception. The man who is trying to deceive you may have more between his ears than you have. That means that he just may deceive you. Those fallen angels are still angels, even though fallen. And while they have been degenerated, so have we. And they started much higher. Except for the Spirit of God, they have an advantage over us in theological arguments. With the spirit, we have the advantage. Theology alone is nothing but human wisdom and human mental power, and we have some problems. These problems have become worse as time goes along. These are difficult times. How do you distinguish truth from error without the Holy Spirit? There are many who run from false arguments rather than try to handle them. There are so many Adventists today with new theories who are certain they are right. There's a story about certain Adventist ministers who are sure they were right on a particular subject. The Adventist ministers who disagreed with them were sure that the other ministers were wrong. Which ones were right, you say? Well, tell me the problem and I will tell you who is right. No, you will not. The fact that you are totally convic convinced that you are right means that you are just as wrong as they are. You, like them, are just as sure that you are correct. That is the problem. It is our absolute certainty that we are right that prevents us from seeing that we are wrong. Let, us, let me repeat a short passage from a previous quote and comment on it. Without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of His Word is of no avail. One may be familiar with the commands and promises of the Bible, but unless the Spirit of God sets the truth home, the character will not be transformed. Somehow we have the strange idea that there is some place you can go on this earth to a school where your deficiencies will all be taken care of. There, that there are some degrees or some institution or some professor where whatever you lack in your particular work for the Lord will all be fixed up and taken care of. Many people are in pursuit of that knowledge and experience. They think that it must come about in education, but I have checked with people in many schools and they do not seem to have any more than anybody else. In fact, sometimes they seem to have less. We must go to the place where the Spirit of God is promised to us and not accept substitutes. 
we will never finish the work by going about seeking everything else but the Spirit of God. That is a detour of delaying, a delaying of his return. You can philosophize all you want, but you are wasting time and, not, and are not going about your father's business. The father's business is to hasten the coming of Jesus. We will never finish it in all these blind alleys and detours that we defend as being good. They might be good, but they will not finish this work, and that is what counts. It does not matter how good it is, and you can defend it all you want, but that is not the important thing. The Lord wants to take charge and use us to do his bidding in finishing the work. Remember that we are not to use the Spirit. He is to use us. Taking into consideration all that we as people are trying to do to finish the work, why are we glorifying our human inventions and seeming successes more than seeking the Spirit of God? I want us all to realize and examine what we are doing. We need to examine our seeking for many methods, ideas, education, and use of modern technology. We are running and always busy, but never finding the Spirit of God. Ask yourself, how concerned am I about helping finish the Lord's work? It does not matter what we do unless the Spirit of God comes and blesses us in whatever we do. Human standards of success seem to surround a few layman organizations, but too much credit and glory are being taken by them that should go to God. All that, may, all that many are doing is treading water, going no place, and accomplishing little to hasten his second coming. Yet trying to convince them of that is nearly impossible. In Testimonies to the Church, Volume 8, it says, God does not ask us to do in our own strength the work before us. He has provided divine assistance for all the emergencies to which our human resources are unequal. Christ has made provision that his church shall be transformed, body illumined with the light of heaven, possessing the glory of Emmanuel. It is his purpose that every Christian shall be surrounded with a spiritual atmosphere of light and peace. There is no limit to the usefulness of one who, putting self aside, makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. Christ declared that the divine influence of the Spirit has to be with his followers until the end. But the promise is not appreciated as it should be, and therefore its ful fulfillment is not seen as it might be. The promise of the Spirit is a matter little thought of, and the result is only, that might, only what might be expected. Spiritual drought, spiritual darkness, spiritual de declination, and death. Minor matters occupy the attention, and the divine power which is necessary for growth and prosperity of the church and which would bring all other blessings in its train is lacking through offer though offered in its infinite plenitude it is the absence of the spirit that makes the gospel ministry so powerless that last sentence explains our situation in a nutshell we have come to the place where we will not even admit that it is powerless we baptize a few souls in one year while well, tens and millions of new souls are born into the world. And we still will not admit that our ministry of soul winning is so powerless. We, see, we seem to be impossible to convince that our methods will never finish the work. Without the Spirit leading the work, we are mostly ineffective, but we seem to have no problems advertising to the world and to ourselves how great a job we are doing at finishing the work. We have seen the following quote earlier, but I put it here again to emphasize that spirit-filled workers without any planning of their own will finish the work. Let me tell you that the Lord will work in this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things and in a way that will be contrary to any human planning. God will use, me 
ways and means by which it will be seen that he is taking the reins in his own hands. The workers will be promised, but will be surprised by the simple means that he will use to bring about and perfect his work of righteousness. That's evangelism, page 118. Learning, talent, eloquence, money, in all manner of human ideas and devising, even though used in a spirit of humility and with great hope and confidence, will not finish the work. We must someday admit that. Without the presence of the Spirit of God, no heart will be touched, no sinner won to Christ. On the other hand, if they, the workers, the harvesters, are connected with Christ, if the gifts of the Spirit are theirs, the poorest and most ignorant of those disciples will have a power that will tell upon hearts. God makes them channels for the outflowing flowing of the highest influence in the universe. I do not believe that we are sufficiently impressed of what can be ours and what is available to us through God's methods. I think we have been keeping the doors of our hearts locked to the Spirit's presence for many decades. The Spirit starts with a still, small voice to every one of us without exceptions. Yet minor matters have occupied our attention. Something else, no matter how important we think it is, crowds him out. We just do not have the time, or we think it is not of sufficient value to take our time. Then difficult situations arise where we have been strongly compelled to seek him. Perhaps accidents, tragedies, calamities, disasters, or other crises have come up into our lives and said to us that we really need to take time to open the door to the Spirit. We may seek him diligently, but in a few days we forget, and the Laodicean spirit takes over. We get lethargic, sleepy, and negligent. Before long, we are right back in the same routine as before. We wait for a more violent time to come along and shake us awake, at which time we will seek him. It is not the Spirit's fault that there is neglect. I think that it has become a habit that we are, we are prone to not respond when spoken to by the Spirit. It does not seem that important. We may discern a little inspiration or a picking of the heart, pricking of the heart, and we forget about it after a while, like when you prick your finger and go your way without it seeming to bother you. Yet we keep thinking that someday our circumstances will become more sufficiently traumatic to impress us. The spirit of prophecy says that it will be too late when things become that violent. Those in that care category will not have enough oil for their lamps. Then Jesus will have to say to them, say to those who neglect or refuse partaking of the spirit, what he said to the disciples after his agony in Gethsemane. He said, sleep on. I think that the Lord weeps when he sees how many thousands of times he has offered us the blessings of pouring out his spirit and how difficult it is to stir us to action, to get us involved, each in a way that is consistent, consistent with the talents he has given to us. If we really accept in our hearts what we read in Zechariah, not by night, might nor by power, but by my spirit, if we really knew that one qualification, we would be equipped to do the work that God wants us to do. If we would only learn that it is not what we achieve or what we try to do or have to do, but, what it, but that it is what we have in the person of the Spirit of God, then we would really shine brightly in the darkened world. Great success, as God views success, would have come and the work would be completed as it was by Zerubbabel in the temple. The Spirit makes all the difference. Paul had gone to Athens with his eloquence and all his learning, and he was a well-educated man. He had little success there. When he went to Corinth from Athens, he resolved to do it differently. In 1 Corinthians 2.4, Paul says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man, man's wisdom, 
but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Paul was saying that he did not depend on the logic, theology, eloquence, or education of man, but with the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That is how he went to Corinth, and there he had many amazing results. Although Corinth was extremely wicked, still the people would flock to hear Paul, and many were converted. We desperately need God to help us to recognize that there is just one central problem, one thing that caused the five virgins to be left out. And they said they had done many good things, and they had a certain amount of oil for their lamps. It was the lack of having enough oil that prevented them from being allowed inside. They had not sensed their lack of the Holy Spirit. May God impress our hearts just now, and may we be impressible, is my, pre- is my prayer. And may we sense his voice and why he has not come to fill us and why we are not more effective. God would have our whole lives full of radiance that he might be seen in human beings, then that might men might take knowledge that we have been with Jesus. The Spirit will shine in our homes, our hospitals, schools, and all our institutions, filling them with a heavenly brightness that will glorify God and not us. We especially need our churches to be filled with light, for the world in darkness is seeking for that light. <laughs>